Did you ever wonder why some coins have tiny ridges on them and other coins are smooth? Well, what if I told you those ridges are the direct result of the collision of two massive objects known as neutron stars billions of years ago? That's right, and today on this episode of Into the Impossible, I'll explain why. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Here's a picture of a very, very famous rabbi. His name is Rabbi Simcha Barnum of Fajista. He taught his students, everyone must have two pockets with a note in each one so that he can reach into one or the other depending on the need. When feeling lowly and depressed, discouraged and disconsolate, one note would read, the universe was created for my sake. But when feeling haughty, high and mighty, one should have another note in the other pocket that says, I am nothing but dust and ashes. And sometimes you reach into your pockets and you feel the jingling of coins. And some of those coins have ridges on them or flutes. And today we're gonna to explain why those flutes got there. And actually those flutes can remind us of these two expressions, that the universe was created for us and that we're nothing but dust and ashes. Here's how. We know that the universe is not centered on us, but it's helpful to act as if it's so, at least in a diagram like this, taken from my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. This shows our view of the cosmos as if it were a pristine looking glass that we can spy through and not have anything impede our sights back, perhaps, to the origin of the universe itself. However, the universe, as I point out in that very same cosmic memoir, is a very dusty place. A very dirty, smoggy place, not unlike my neighbors to the north in Los Angeles. No offense. The question is, what is that dust, and what can that dust do for us? It turns out, dust has been a very key player in most of our cosmic phenomena that occur on Earth and even flowing through our own veins. If we take a really macroscopic look at the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the formation of stars and galaxies to planets, we increase in complexity until we get to the formation of molecules, of chemistry, and then from chemistry perhaps to biology, from biology to conscious beings such as ourselves. We don't know exactly how either the process of the Big Bang unfolded or how the process of abiogenesis took place, nor how the problem of consciousness emerges. These are the famous chicken or egg problems that I love to discuss. Darwin, in fact, wrote about the lack, the missing ingredient describing the origin of life. Remember, his book was called The Origin of Species. He said, it is no valid objection that science, as yet, throws no light on the far higher problem of the essence or origin of life. It is mere rubbish thinking, at the present, of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. But of course, we know a great deal about the origin of matter. We know Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We've talked about the formation of the elements. We've talked about the processes by which we come to understand the formation of every element on the periodic table coming from either the Big Bang and the lightest elements on the periodic table of hydrogen, helium, lithium, and their isotopes, all the way up to the formation of elements in stars via the work of my late great colleagues, Jeff Burbage, Margaret Burbage, and their collaborators, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle. So, it's not rubbish to think of the origin of matter, so maybe Charlie was wrong. So how could life form? Well, first of all, we have to define what is life. But generally, scientists agree that life has several characteristics, including the ability to acquire and use energy, to metabolize it, to grow and to behave in such a way as to forecast or predict sources of energy. We know that life requires information storage, the presence of a genome that specifies the expression of those genetic characteristics and what's known as a phenotype. We know that life must reproduce or else it would stop at a one-time off affair, and that wouldn't be any fun. And so the ability to reproduce progeny of the same type is quite crucial to the propagation of life. And we also know one of the most powerful forces in the, in, in the life cycle is the evolution by natural selection, the ability to change and adapt to environments to improve the capabilities of energy and uh, acquisition and reproduction. So all those three pri primordial things depend in, in some sense on evolution at the scale of adaptation to environment. So there's this, there's this interplay between the planet and the, the materials that are inorganic and not alive and those that are organic and can lead to living organisms. 
Now, one of the first people to speculate how life could have gotten kicked off from pure chemistry to biology was, again, Charles Darwin. He wrote, It is often said that the conditions on the first production of a living being are now present, which could have been present. So all those conditions were present, he said. But if, and oh, what a big if, he said, we could conceive of in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, with light, with heat, with electricity present, that a protein compound would be chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. So we think of proteins as expressing things that can then later lead to the production of other living things and other proteins. But the problem, again, of chicken or egg arises. You need proteins to produce proteins. So how did proteins come about? This is a great mystery. But some of the first investigations were undertaken by the late, great uh, Harold Urey and his, and his graduate student, Stanley Miller, who became a great scientist in his own right. And our chemistry department, shown in this image here, is named Urey Hall after Harold Urey. So they did a famous experiment in 1952, reproducing what they thought were the conditions like Darwin's little pond. Some conditions representative of the early Earth, with instead of phosphoric salts, they had ammonia and other chemical compounds. They added heat and light into this very cleanly, carefully prepared chemical apparatus with just the right heat at just the right time and just the right electric discharges. And they did find certain complex carbo uh, carbohydrates and other uh, uh, amino acids that were formed, urea and uh, formaldehyde and things like that. And they discovered that you could produce it from a very simple prebiotic um, compounds, you could add heat, energy, and get out not proteins, not DNA, but some chemicals that are precursors, building blocks, like amino acids, that are necessary but not sufficient to create life. So we have this kind of warm little pond. Uh, we have yet to create a DNA and then create a biologist springing out of this compound. But uh, origin of life research continues to this day. So big questions that we've talked about on this channel, which came first, the DNA or the RNA? We've talked about proteins. We've talked about astrobiology and life maybe coming from another planet, as Fred Hoyle called panspermia, the spreading of, of genetic material throughout the universe. Uh, but that doesn't answer the question of the ultimate origin of life on Earth. We've talked about problems of fine-tuning on how the genetic code is a store of information, and according to uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer and others, uh, that information requires some forethought, some preconceived lower entropy state, which then evolves, and he, of course, associates it with a mind, with a god, in his book, Return of the God Hypothesis. Now, the question of whether or not life could have been seeded from outer space doesn't, again, answer the question of the origin of life itself. So how do you get from chemistry to biology? That is a huge leap for which we have no way to to explain at present. But of course, it's a fascinating subject that we m should and continue to study in great depth. We've talked about life um, discovered on other planets and perhaps on our planet. It could be that cosmic dust, these tiny particles that pervade our entire cosmos on every scale from the planet, people, <laughs> your toddler, all the way up to interstellar medium and even beyond, these grains of dust that are leftovers from explosions in the cosmos, whether of supernovae or of other cataclysmic events from combinations and collisions of neutron stars, for example, that, we're, that we'll get to. So when we find objects, how do we know they actually came from space? So I often give out uh, to lucky winners that subscribe to different giveaways on my channel, it's macroscopic meteorites, chunks of outer space material that landed on Earth and were collected, predominantly from a single fall in, uh, in Argentina called the Campo de Cielo. But how do you know it's not just some expensive piece of rock that somebody you know, tricked me into buying? Well, you have to cut it open, and due to the diffusion and the different of, of different uh, atoms, it's actually easier to tell that a iron or nickel meteorite, a metallic meteorite, was formed in space, because these patterns only form from objects formed in space. They came from some asteroid which fragmented and then broke apart, but it had this crystal, these crystal boundaries that are shown in these patterns here. So meteors come and go, they smash into the Earth. The most well-preserved one in all of the planet's surface is in Arizona, meteor crater near Winslow, Arizona. It is almost a perfect exemplar of what a meteor impact would look like. Uh, this occurred, we think, about 50,000 years ago. I always point out how lucky it was that the meteor struck right next to the gift shop. That is just unbelievable timing and luck. Now, what if it was near New York City? Here's an artist's picture I found on the web somewhere that shows what such damage would do, God forbid, if it landed in a major metropolitan area. There are, of course, undersea uh, meteor strikes. Here's one, the Chicxulub Crater, in the north part of the Yucatan Peninsula. It's 180 kilometers wide. 
So it's just enormously bigger than even the meteor crater on Earth. Thankfully, it's under the ocean. Maybe not thankfully. It'd be kind of cool to see it. Um, but it is dated to the same period of time, this Cretaceous tertiary boundary period, uh, and is sometimes called the KT boundary. And that period has been dated all the way around the Earth, and it's about 66 million years ago. We think it was dated, and responsible rather, to, uh, for the extinction of the dinosaurs. So as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, past guest on the show, has said, it's too bad the dinosaurs didn't have a great space program because they could have maybe done something about these interlopers that do come and destroy entire species of the most massive animals on Earth. And perhaps that was fortuitous, you know, if nothing else, because now we exist and maybe we wouldn't, maybe we would, there were mammals back then, but we don't know for sure how the evolutionary tree would have been affected via the presence at the same time of dinosaurs and, and hominids. Uh, so that's just a counterfactual history that we can never know uh, the true result of. Gandhi said the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes the dust under its feet. But the seeker after truth should so humble himself that even the dust could crush him. Only then, and not until then, will he have a glimpse of truth. Now, how does this all connect to our original purpose of digging into our pockets and being humbled or elevated by the notion that we are essentially dust and ashes, or we are the reason that the entire universe was created? Well, it has to do with these flutes or ridges on coins. So there's a connection between Isaac Newton, the father of calculus and universal gravitation, and the ridges on coins. Because actually, old Ike spent a lot of time doing things other than calculus and gravity. He spent not a small amount of time thinking of ways to torture people who were counterfeiting coins. And he actually came up with a solution to the problem of counterfeiting that involves those mysterious ridges on coins. So you'll notice a coin, like a quarter or a dime, which used to be made of either a quarter ounce of silver or a tenth ounce of silver, a precious metal, now is made of non-precious metals, uh, common metals, zinc and tin and things like that. Uh, but back then, it, they were all made, a pound of, uh, uh, that's where the British pound came from, pound of silver. These precious metals were very valuable. And what somebody could do is take a coin, a circular coin, and shave off the outer edges of the coin, imperceptibly for an individual coin, removing a certain amount of silver or gold. And that amount of shavings from the coin's rim could then be eventually combined with many other coins, shaved rims, and you would make enough material to create a brand new coin. So therefore, you'd be creating inflation, you'd be reducing the size of an actual quarter or dime, and you'd be creating new coins out of nothing, essentially, just from grinding it down. This was a big problem, this coin clipping or ways of forgery. And so he set out to both discourage uh, using uh, the methods of torture available to him in the 16 and 17 hundreds in England. But he would also look at uh, these uh, other ways of technological ways to prevent the counterfeiting of coins via this coin clipping method. So why are metals like silver and gold valuable? And why do we not have it on copper? Pennies aren't made of copper again, uh, zinc or something like that. Why don't they have ridges? Well, because copper is not a precious metal. And actually, this has a, a rather stark and scandalous connection to the history of the Jewish people in England in the, in the Middle Ages. In 1278, in this day of Jewish history, as shown in this, uh, in this headline from a few years back, all the Jews of England were arrested <laughs> in a coin-clipping scandal. And it's really no joke, because many of them were tortured and killed. Um, this is long before Newton. And uh, so they didn't really have ways against this, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism at the time as well. This process led to the expulsion of Jews for hundreds of years. So it was really thanks to Isaac Newton's innovation to put these ridges on precious metals, on precious metal-minted coins, that would be a telltale deterrent to those trying to shave down the coin-clipping method that really got rid of this scandal and the byproducts thereof and allowed the Jews eventually to come back to England. So it's interesting that this character, Isaac Newton, had as one of his you know, many, many contributions to, to history and civilization, as Einstein called him, the greatest contributor to Western civilization, uh, that one of them was to effectively allow Jews and other people to live without suspicion of this coin clipping or counterfeiting or inflationary practice. So with the large amounts of money, Isaac Newton used his role as Warden of the Mint in 1696 
to form a new way, a new invention of preventing the rounding of money and making of the edges with letters or with engravings. So this is an invention uh, that was quite valuable to the prevention and deterrence of counterfeiting. So the recoinage in, uh, initiated by Newton is really the reason that this counterfeiting stopped and is the reason you have these things in your pocket that have ridges on them. And they come from these rare earth elements. So in 2017, astronomers around the world recorded this first collision that was seen both by LIGO and by optical telescopes around the world. And it was the collision of neutron stars. And these two neutron stars came together and, uh, and ignited this, this massive explosion seen uh, really across the universe and uh, for us to see it here in the Milky Way galaxy, hundreds of light years away, hundreds of millions of light years away. And this collision was of two neutron stars. So neutrons are the subatomic particles, the atomic nuclei that are the uh, composed of quarks. And these quarks, when they come together, they can uh, comprise either a proton or a neutron. In this case, the entire star almost is neutron rich material. And when they come together, they make objects, they make elements rather, that are very rich in neutrons. And two such elements that are like that, or three such elements that are like that, are platinum, gold, and, uh, and silver. So silver is used for coins, gold too, platinum less so, but still used as a precious metal. So the inspiring collision of these neutron stars, only observed 400 years after Newton's uh, coin minting, that's the reason. These are very rare. These neutron stars do not collide very often. So the rarity of it, plus it has to be eventually incorporated in the Earth's crust and then mined and minted and forged, etc. cetera. Uh, it's an incredibly energy intensive process and incredibly rare, sort of a proof of work for these rare elements like gold, platinum, and silver. And so their rarity, their scarcity is the reason they must be protected when they're used in coins. And that's the reason why your pockets are filled with some coins that have on them these ridges. So again, can you spare a dime? One side of your pocket should have a note or maybe you could reach in and feel that coin and that coin will have ridges and maybe in the other one you don't have ridges, you have a penny in there and you'll recognize that you are nothing but dust and ashes, just like the cosmos, just like those non-precious metals like copper or zinc. But on the other one, you get the illustrious feeling that the universe might have been made just for you. I'm Brian Keating, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at UC San Diego. Thank you for going into the impossible. If you enjoyed this video, you definitely want to check out this playlist with my cosmology friends talking about the origin and evolution of the universe. And if you're interested in a deep dive in the multiverse, wormholes, and other exotic phenomena, click here and hear my conversation with Juan Maldesena of the Institute for Advanced Study. Enjoy! And don't forget to subscribe for more amazing content.